Check this out. June 17th, 1998. And you see down here, or can you see? That right there, that is a Sam Doodle. Actually, remember what that is a doodle of. That is a doodle of uh, something I was building out of Lego at the time. I used to doodle all over the margins of my papers at school. See, that little strip along the edge of the paper and along the top there. A very tiny amount of free space on a page otherwise devoted to notes and schoolwork. And I actually designed all kinds of things in the margins of the paper, like that castle, uh, that moon castle I built for the Disney Imagineering thing. That started out as sketches on the on the margins of my of my school papers. Oh wait, yeah, yeah there, there it is. That's a little doodle of the, uh, of the moon kingdom. And I think that's an overhead view of it. A place to uh, kind of let my mind wander during class. Yeah, it was almost like meditative, just letting the pen go off on its own, let it take a shape and do it over and over again, let it slightly evolve with each iteration, take on some character, and um, eventually it would start building up a story around whatever it was I was doodling, and then <laughs> the doodles could get pretty complicated. Although a lot of doodles, I don't, I don't exactly know what was going on. I don't know. There was like this direct line between my brain and the pen, and it would just go wherever it would go, and I don't really know what the meaning of the doodles were. And sketching on the margins of these pages for a non-art class was somehow a lot easier than actually drawing something <laughs> on a blank page for an art class. I've always found it so much easier to create things in the margins, to draw things in these extra spaces and these extra little bits of time that I can find while doing other things. Sometimes I'm supposed to be doing other things. <laughs> Part of that is because if you tell yourself, all right, right now I have to be creative, that can be very stressful and you get worried about every single thing you're doing. But just doodling in the margin of some paper and there's no stakes to it, that can be a lot more creatively freeing. I think one big element that produces a lot of creative thinking that directly leads to play is boredom. Can you even remember the last time that you were bored? Not just that you were scrolling on your phone or like half watching something on TV that you weren't really interested in, but actually stuck bored. Maybe it was the last time you were listening to this podcast. <laughs> that forced quiet of boredom is is becoming rarer, especially because we have devices where any minute we can pull it up and be distracted from our boredom. Even if I think I'm doing something that's like somewhat productive, like listening to an audiobook while I wash dishes or do chores, what I'm really doing is filling in that quiet with distraction because I feel like I can't be unoccupied. But that space is time that if I didn't have a distraction, I would otherwise have to fill in with my own imagination. One of the reasons play is becoming a harder concept to grasp, is becoming something we are actually seeing less of, is because boredom is becoming less of a thing. Adults definitely don't ever want to be bored and we have the ability to do things to not be bored. And that might be one reason why adults seem to play a lot less. I certainly struggle with this. I don't wanna be bored. If I am waiting in line for something, um, anytime there's a brief moment, it's, you know, it's super instinctual. Just pull up my phone and start doing email or checking things, you know, anything so that way the quiet doesn't start happening inside my brain. All that busyness can really leave me with like a head buzz. And then when you've acclimated to that head buzz, going back to quiet can feel uncomfortable. It's like when you've had a really sugary soda. Oh, I don't know. Baja blast. And then you try to have an apple or a glass of water and it because it's not nearly as sweet, it's too bland, it's too quiet. Something similar to that happens when I try to fill up all of my time with you know, constant noise, constant entertainment, constant distraction. That lack of quiet, lack of boredom, I think really affects my imagination and my ability to play. And it's not that there aren't times where, you know, we're in such a stressful situation, we just need a distraction, we just need to take a break. But I think because it's become the default, what we're missing out on is a lot of time that would we would feel bored. And I think boredom is a really fertile, creative space. It's the margin of the paper where we can doodle in and let our minds wander, try out possibilities. There's, there's no consequence, there's no stakes, there's just filling in a blank space on the page, filling in some blank time in your life. So, uh, yeah. Come along for today's episode of Untangling Toys, where we're exploring the exciting world of boredom. Even though the topic of today's show is about boredom, hopefully it'll be very interesting because it's really about creativity and, and making space for the creative process. Before we get started, I think I want to doodle 
during this episode. So, um, yeah, if you're listening to this and, and you have a piece of paper and a pen handy, why don't you doodle along with me? Let's let me let me move the camera. So oh, let me move the camera so we can we can you can see what I'm doodling. OK, so <laughs> I guess real quickly before we talk about doodling, I'll just talk about my favorite doodling instrument. I used to almost always just use pencil, but then I started to notice in high school that pencil doodles would just get smudged out and erased. And then it'd be like, oh, my, all my hard work, uh, I can't really tell what it was anymore. So then I started using ink. And my favorite pen was the Pilot G2 pen, which I don't actually have one with me here. But the Pilot G2 pen uh, in 0.7, that's what I used. I don't have a single Pilot G2 on me anymore. But those are what I used uh, almost nonstop throughout college. I went through so many of them. I even bought, instead of, instead of buying um, ex extra pens, I would just buy the refill inks so that way I didn't have to, you know, waste all the pen bodies. But then one Christmas I got this, which is a fountain pen. Uh, this is from Muji. A friend got me started on fountain pens. I really enjoy the, the writing experience with a fountain pen. Um, there's a bit of a learning curve to make a fountain pen your everyday pen, especially when it comes to managing the ink. Like for the longest time, I, I was using um, ink cartridges, single use ink cartridges, and I made a huge mess. And then when I start, changed over to refillable cartridges, I was still making a huge mess. But uh, over time, I learned to make less of a mess. Uh, I primarily got this fountain pen because I liked the look of it. It's brass. It's very heavy brass. And so the thing about this pen is it's <laughs> if you use it for a while, you do feel very important writing with it. But it's heavy. And after a while, uh, the grip on it isn't the greatest. So you start to get tired of that. This is my favorite pen. This is a Lamy Safari. It's a classic pen. They've been making Lamy Safaris for a really long time. It's pretty darn cheap. It's an all plastic body, um, so it's lightweight and it's really comfortable to hold. I use a refillable ink cartridge. Rather than buying a whole bunch of single use pens, I've had this pen for about three years, I think. This pen for me fits all my writing needs. It's a really nice fountain pen experience. It's light, it's durable. You don't have to do too much maintenance to keep it in tip top condition. However, you just need a pen for school. Uh, these Sharpie S gels are really good. These, I guess these are kind of new and they are fantastic. It's a very nice definite line. It flows really well. Doesn't look like anything too special, but it is a great pen. And then this is another pen I have a bunch of, but I don't use them too much, but they are pretty cool. It's a Uniball Signo RT and it is 0 0.38. So that is a very, very fine line. Sorry, I just, I don't, I, I haven't gotten to talk about pens before. So feel free to doodle along as we talk. The kind of boredom I'm talking about is when your mind, which is capable of nearly unlimited imaginative possibilities, isn't currently occupied, and so it goes on a search for something to do. Ideally, after some searching or brainstorming, your mind will stumble upon something that attracts it, and now your mind starts sinking into that thing, and your imagination kicks in, and before you know it, you're playing. Remember in, in episode one, I talked about playing in the Costco while my mom shopped and I pretended a quarter was the Millennium Falcon. That play started with me being bored in the aisles of the store without my normal distractions. My bored mind took inventory of whatever I had on me to fiddle with, and that is how I turned a quarter into a spaceship. Our mental capacity is often so much greater than the demands around us, and it doesn't take a whole lot of brain power to do the dishes or fold laundry or sometimes <laughs> pay attention in class. You, you, you should pay attention in class, but sometimes it just doesn't take all of, all of the brain to do that. It's like that extra capacity wants to do something. It's like a Formula One race car. It needs to go full speed sometimes and it gets antsy if it's limited to just going 15 miles an hour. I think boredom is the difference between our potential, the potential that your mind could be doing and what it is currently being asked or allowed to do. And when you can turn that extra mental capacity into something like doodling on the margins of your paper, you start playing. Free play, unstructured play. And like a race car taking all the turns of a track, sometimes it's weaving through complex turns, sometimes it's taking the straightaway at full speed, uh, and other times maybe it's just kind of like spinning donuts in the parking lot. And yeah, also, <laughs> sometimes it can crash. Free play can smack into a wall, even 
go up in flames. The good thing is when you are in this state of play, you can just do that part again. Like you can try that part where you crashed again and, and try not to crash this time. And you can learn from your last crash and make changes. This is what I do all the time with my Lego builds. I would get stuck with a building problem and after trying something, it, it wouldn't work. In fact, it would fail spectacularly and I'd have a huge mess. This happened a lot when I was trying to make a Lego zoetrope, which is, um, it's a big spinning table full of multiple copies of a Lego build and they're all posed slightly differently. And what's supposed to happen is when that table spins around and there's a strobe light that's shining on it, flashing on it in synchronization with the turning of the table and it's supposed to create the illusion that these Lego sculptures are moving around and are animated. Building the Lego part of that was easy, <laughs> but what took a lot of tries was trying to get the table and the light to synchronize and actually create the effect. Try this a lot of different ways with a lot of different motor speeds and, and, and different kinds of strobe lights and messing with the circuitry, but I really just ended up <laughs> with a big mess. However, I had also learned a lot about the problem I was trying to solve. I learned a lot about the motor speeds, frame rates, strobe lights, circuits, for, for making all of this stuff happen. I was able to use all my crashes, all my tries, <laughs> to get closer to a working solution. And you know what? A after all of that work, it still didn't really work. <laughs> we got closer though. We got closer though. We tried a lot of really interesting solutions. We were kind of playing around trying to figure out how to make this thing work. Even though sometimes it was really frustrating when it wouldn't work and how we hit a wall so many times. But the enemy of this whole process of turning boredom into play is distractions. Distractions are different than play. If play lets your mind use its full potential, distractions, they gradually leak away all of that fuel. Okay, this is mixing up the metaphors of our vehicles, but if our race car was a steam engine, a train, all of that fire um, has heated up the boiler and we have all this steam ready to drive the pistons and move the train, that's, that's what boredom is building up. But distractions, it's like a little pressure release valve for the steam. It comes out in little puffs or a high-pitched whistle. And so instead of all that steam moving the train, it just whooshes out the sides and, and we don't go anywhere. And distractions are really tempting. Even writing this and editing this, I am constantly distracted by dozens of things. And almost all of them are on my phone. And very few of them are consequential. But that's the thing about distractions. They're shiny little things that draw my attention away. All these little problems are, are easier to solve and it's so much more relieving to be distracted by them than to sit with the anxiety and discomfort of boredom or, or a problem that you don't know how to solve. But I, I think if we're too addicted to distractions, then you know, that becomes the norm. And if we're always distracted and never bored, that leads to less play and less creative thinking. John Cleese, he's a very silly man, and he gave a great talk at a conference in 1991 called On Creativity in Management. And you can still watch this online, and I, I highly recommend that you do. It's about creative thinking, play, and humor, all three things that I love. I've been talking a little interchangeably about creativity and play, but, but that's okay, because they are very interchangeable. Kinnan showed that the most creative had simply acquired a facility for getting themselves into a particular mood, a way of operating, which allowed their natural creativity to function. In fact, Kinnan, McKinnon described this particular facility as an ability to play. Indeed, he described the most creative when in this mood as being childlike, for they were able to play with ideas, to explore them, not for any immediate practical purpose, but just for enjoyment. Play for its own sake. The McKinnon that he's referring to is Donald McKinnon, a professor at UC Berkeley who studied the psychology of creativity. Creative thinking and play are almost the same thing. When you're playing, you're engaged in creative thinking. When you're creative thinking, you're playing. So how do we play? Cleese talks about two modes of thinking, open and closed. Open thinking is play. By contrast, the open mode is, is a relaxed, expansive, less purposeful mode, in which we're probably more contemplative, uh, more inclined to humor, which always accompanies a wider perspective, and consequently more playful. It's a mood in which curiosity for its own sake can operate, because we're not under pressure to get a specific thing done quickly. We can play. And that is what allows our natural creativity to surface. Closed thinking is still important. That's like when you're focused on an idea that you came up with in open thinking, and you need both, but you're not going to come up with a new idea in closed thinking. So in order to have open thinking, you need quiet. 
So you have to create some space for yourself away from those demands. And that means sealing yourself off. You must make a quiet space for yourself where you will be undisturbed. Next, time. It's not enough to create space. You have to create your space for a specific period of time. You have to know that your space will last until exactly, say, 3.30, and that at that moment your normal life will start again. And it's only by having a specific moment when your space starts and an equally specific moment when your space stops that you can seal yourself off from the everyday closed mode in which we all habitually operate. You could call this quiet time like meditation or focus. Um, and I think that's a really good practice, especially for adults, to specifically set aside some quiet time. But I think it's also like it's really similar to boredom. It's just boredom is quiet time or time to meditate that you weren't planning on or that you got forced into. If you're waiting around, waiting for a bus, a plane to get picked up, if you're on a long line at the store, you could find yourself being bored and wanting to reach for a distraction. But if you're comfortable being bored, you can turn those moments into play. However, most of us aren't comfortable being bored, and so we want to pull out a distraction. But I bet if you didn't have any distractions, it would be uncomfortable at first, but if you kept waiting and refused to be distracting, I think eventually you will be bored. And once you are bored, you're well on your way to playing. What's great about play that comes from boredom is how unstructured and free it is. It's not like play where it's like, okay, everybody get together, this is what we're gonna do, this is the rules, it's just it's, it's a wide open free play. Like I talked about in the Magnetiles episode from Stuart Brown's book, Play, the first of the seven properties of play is that it is apparently purposeless. It's done for its own sake. A lot of parents would ask me how Lego can help their kid develop better math, engineering, skills, spatial reasoning. And while playing with Lego bricks can do that and in a very fun way, I think what's more valuable than developing those math skills, all those skills, is developing play skills. And I've definitely tried to teach the educational part of Lego before the play part of Lego, and it didn't really go as well. It was kind of more frustrating. I used to teach this Lego robotics class, and I was trying to use Lego robotics to teach the kids how to write uh, programming, and programming is a valuable skill. However, trying to teach them just to program with Lego, that's just another assignment, like any other assignment, until it becomes play. I had a lesson plan, and I could teach the lesson plan, but I noticed that it was really the kids who would start to play with what we were doing, not just do what I was teaching them, that's when things got more interesting. And that's when the kids got more involved. Now, as a teacher, this meant things got uh, busier and more complicated, more frustrating for me because now some kids were following the lesson plan and others were going off in their own direction, trying to build a giant Lego robot that could smash into another Lego robot. So it was tricky to balance those two, but those kids who were coming up with their own unique questions about how can I program this robot to flip the other robot over, that was, that was a very interesting problem that they were very enthusiastic enthusiastic about tackling. It's pretty complicated, but in their state of play, they were more interested in using what I was teaching, the programming, to do that complicated thing than, than, than what I was trying to teach them, which was less complicated, which was just kind of driving an obstacle course. I think what had happened a little bit was that they had gotten bored of that lesson and their imaginations took them to robot fights. If their parents wanted them to learn programming, I think those kids learned it a lot better by following their own interests through play than by trying to follow my lesson. And it's not like I'm a really great programming teacher or really any kind of teacher. I think all that I'm trying to ever do is get kids interested in making things that they're interested in making, like spark their interest and just let them go from there. If they don't know how to like get started, um, a lesson plan is a good first step. But the thing I can't really teach, I can only really demonstrate with my own example, is how to be interested in something enough that you take it up on your own and you you play with it. Because once you have that spark, you'll seek out all the education you need to make things happen. If you really wanted to learn how to make those robots fight, you would get so deep into all kinds of tutorials about how to program robots, how to build different kinds of limbs for your robot, and how to make them fight. <laughs> This is kind of like that other episode where I was talking about building a slap -a phone just because I was interested into it and I got all into the physics of how to make sounds. Nobody was assigning me to learn all this stuff, but I, I had just had a weird interest and I was following it. This is another quote from Stuart Brown's book. We may think that we are helping to prepare our kids for the future when we organize all their time, when we continually ferry them from one adult organized, adult regulated activity to another. And of course, to some degree, these activities do promote culturally approved behavior 
behavior as well as reinforce our roles as good parents. But, in fact, we may be taking from them the time they need to discover for themselves their most vital talents and knowledge. We may be depriving them of access to an inner motivation for activity that will later blossom into a motive force for life. And then a few pages later, he says, I advise allowing wisely guided personal choice initiated by your child. Provide plenty of environmental opportunities early and encourage early play patterns that have risen directly from natural choices that your child's early play demonstrates. That's really the core of all I can teach when it comes to play and creativity is show a lot of options, show my enthusiasm for the things that resonate with me, hopefully show off the enthusiasm that have resonated with other people, and then through exposure to these different things, whatever is uniquely interesting to you will get you going, get that spark going. There's already going to be so much structure to most people's lives, and the structure is getting imposed earlier and earlier and earlier on people. So it's important to make space Make some empty space, make some empty room, room even for boredom. And that'll allow these original impulses for play to emerge and inspire you for whatever direction that, that most resonates with you. So here's sort of the breakdown the way I see it. Creative thinking is valuable for society because it helps us with problem solving and we can tackle big issues that we're all dealing with. But it's also beneficial for the individual because we have the capacity to imagine all these things and it's fun. It's fun for its own sake to play and be creative. But in order to get into a state of play, you need the conditions of quiet, safety, and freedom from distractions. And those are also the ingredients for a situation like boredom, the state of boredom where spontaneous imaginative thought can emerge from. Because once you start being bored and you can sit with that anxiety and not reach for a distraction, your mind and your body will start playing around and in that state of play and in that open mode of thinking, you'll start having all those exciting creative thoughts. I'm sure this can look really different for all sorts of people because it's not just the stereotype of a bored person being like, ugh, so bored. I think uh, for everybody, like the way that their mind passes the time could look different. For me, it just seems to have manifested itself into doodling on the margins of my school papers. But I'm curious, uh, let me know in the comments what sort of ways do you doodle or what sort of ways do you turn boredom into creative thoughts? I mean, the great thing about doodling is it's very cheap. <laughs> and easy to do. It feels really safe to be creative there because there are no stakes. I don't even have a piece of dedicated paper for this doodling. That's how low the stakes are. No consequences for making a mistake in a doodle in the margins. And it lets my boredom or my excess imagination have an outlet. And those doodles can grow into designs and become solutions to problems that I'm working on, or they could turn into nothing. And that's also okay. They don't have any obligation to do anything. They're just for fun. And yeah, in turn, projects that started out as doodles or playing around, they did teach me a lot about science, math, engineering, uh, problem solving, dealing with frustration while problem solving, teaching me to learn how to learn, but it all started with play. Play is the engine pulling all those other cars, and play is the only one that's an engine. None of those other cars could run, could pull the rest of the train. Play's gotta be in the lead. Although now that I think about it, sometimes trains do push cars. So I guess it's possible that play could push another car trains. Sorry, I started thinking about trains and I got distracted. I derailed. If you're looking for ways to practice boredom, like in a good way, I really recommend going on walks. When I get into a state of mind where I'm just so hectically thinking, I was like, oh, I'm unacclimated to the quiet that I need. Uh, yeah, going on a long walk without any distraction is a good way. It's just the beat of your feet on the ground and the environment around you. It's a really good way to free up space and let the imagination fill in all that quiet that I haven't had in a long time. And a lot of times if I'm working on a problem and I'm like, I don't know what the solution is, um, I'll go on a walk and I'll just walk until I think of a solution. <laughs> and that might be really fast. I might be on a walk for like 10 minutes and I think, oh, wait, that might work. I wanna go back and try that. Or I go on a walk for an hour and I don't come up with anything that day. That's okay. The next day, try something see what happens. It's it's very possible that for a lot of people, they might think, oh, right now I'm just doing nothing. I'm just being bored. I'm just looking at that cloud. And you might think you're bored. But I think that's really just an act of imagination, getting up and running, just looking at trees and taking it in, scribbling a scribble on the side of the page. And that, that might be all that you get that day. But another day you're doing that, and then an idea comes to you. All of a sudden, like, how did it come out of those squiggles or from staring at a blue sky? Well, because you were there. 
because <laughs> he made room for some quiet time, some boredom time, and that's that's where it emerged. Uh, that's all for this week's episode of Untangling Toys. Thank you very much for joining me for this topic of uh, of boredom. Hopefully you were not bored. We didn't really talk about a toy today. I mean, pens, drawing. But if you have any questions about toys or play, you can always uh, leave a comment or reach out to us directly at untanglingtoys at gmail.com. I'm really curious to know what ways you turn boredom into play. Yeah, and what that looks like for you. Is it doodling? Is it music? New Doodling, that's what they call it when you're like just playing around on the piano or with it on an instrument. So, doodling, noodling, what's another word? Foodling? Is that what chefs call it when they're just messing around in the kitchen? What, whatever you do, uh, I hope you have fun doing it. Till next time, bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>